Today, I have my dream job. I'm a tenured professor teaching what I love, which is mathematics, at the University of Victoria, as well as here on YouTube. But 10 years ago, this was an unlikely path to say the least, because becoming a professor can be a very hard journey. Indeed, just having a PhD, well, only a small percentage of people with PhDs go on to become a professor, and it definitely was a hard journey for me. I've never felt comfortable sharing this story on YouTube, in part because of how personal it is and the transformations that I had to go through. However, I think I'm ready and maybe it helps somebody, so let's give it a shot. I want to begin the story late in my PhD in mathematics at the University of Toronto, because my PhD was a bit of a mixed bag emotionally. On the one hand, I discovered my love and passion for teaching mathematics while I was a graduate student. I actually didn't expect this, that's not why I went into a PhD, but as part of your PhD, you often have to do some teaching. It might be marking or being a teaching assistant for tutorials, but by the end, often, you can actually be a full course instructor, and I had done that a number of times, and I really enjoyed it. I just love sharing my enthusiasm and appreciation for mathematics with my students, for supporting them on their journey. I loved that teaching side of the PhD. But on the other hand, I had a lot of negative emotion around the research side of my PhD, the, the main portion of my PhD. I enjoyed parts of my PhD, but it had become crystal clear to me that I didn't want to continue in pure math research. I didn't want to go on and do a postdoc, which is the natural step if you want to stay in academia in research. And I just didn't really want any more to do with the research side of things. And I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of self-criticism, a lot of self-doubt about all of that. And I knew that that wasn't the career that I wanted, even if I was able to, which, I mean, I probably wasn't. With the benefit of hindsight, I've come to recognize that a lot of those emotions are pretty common in PhD students. And sort of a sense of uh, imposter syndrome, for example, is a common experience that many people have. But at the time, nevertheless, it was crystal clear I did not want to go on and continue in a job as a research mathematician. So if I love teaching and didn't want to go do research, where does that leave me? And to be honest, I'd just been avoiding that question when out of the blue one day, an crazy opportunity just fell in my lap. At the University of Toronto, they had an emergency posting. What they needed was for one year, a professorship to teach seven different courses of mathematics in one year. And because it was an emergency posting, there wasn't time for like a months long international search the way they normally would be for a normal professor position. Probably they were going to choose someone who was like a known entity who was there in Toronto and, and ready to teach more or less the next day. I had nothing ready, no CV, teaching dossier, anything. So I stayed up late, I put in my documents, I was basically told to apply. And then on September 2nd, I discovered that yes, I had been approved to be a teaching professor starting on September 1st. And not only was I gonna be doing the thing that I loved, I was gonna make four times the amount of money than I would have as just a PhD student, where PhD students get a small salary, but it's not very much in Canada. Now, I should emphasize, this was extraordinarily lucky. And in part, I really want to credit one student. You see, I was teaching this tutorial and one student wrote to the person who makes all the teaching appointments and said that they really appreciated what I did. They, they really liked me as a teacher, which was just an incredibly kind thing to do. But they may not have realized the result because the math department at the University of Toronto has a teaching award for its graduate teaching assistants. And well, okay, they gave it to me. And I think nobody really would have known whether I was doing a great job or a bad job, but for this one student who wrote in and, and told the department that they thought I did a good job. And then when it came time to hire, you probably were gonna choose from some of the graduating PhD students, what about the person who won the teaching award, which, which was somehow me? And so I really feel like that one student writing in had an incredible impact on me getting this sort of incredibly lucky position. Because now when I graduated, I wasn't just somebody with a PhD, I was a PhD and a professor of mathematics at the University of Toronto, even if it was only a one year sort of contractually limited position. So there I was, I was being a full professor, I taught seven courses in a year, I was doing that by day. At night, I was trying to finish off the loose ends of my PhD, which we discovered were actually somewhat looser than we thought. So I think it took me another seven or eight months to finish the PhD that I, I previously had thought was really imminent. But nevertheless, I loved the teaching side of the job. And, and now I was motivated. Now I realized this was the kind of thing I wanted to do. 
And so as the Toronto job started ending, I was applying for jobs. Now, in Canada, there's basically two major classifications of teaching jobs in academia. The holy grail of what I wanted to do was a tenure track teaching professorship. So everything you probably imagine for a research professorship, but for somebody who is focused on teaching. So you have the job security, you have the salary and the benefits, as well as the opportunity to not just teach, but to do service and to do scholarship in conjunction with your teaching. Now, these jobs are incredibly rare. They were almost non-existent 20 years ago, but they've been starting to come in. However, if you go on the job market and look, I mean, for many years that I was looking, there was either zero of these jobs posted or just one or two in all of Canada. On the flip side, what was much more common is that, unfortunately, at least in my view, a lot of universities really rely on more precarious employment from their instructors. For example, we have something called sessional positions. You might be hired to teach just a single course, right? Part-time, limited benefits, limited pay, and, and job security, basically nothing. This was probably going to be the most likely path that someone with my qualifications would get. And so I started applying. I actually applied to, I think, 27 different uh, universities in Canada as well as the United States. And of those 27 applications, I think I did five interviews and I got three offers. Two of them were sort of either a nine-month position or a two-year position. But the third one, the University of Cincinnati, was a permanent, technically not tenure, but very similar to tenure-track position as a teaching professor at the University of Cincinnati. By the way, I will note that when you start getting offers, you get a little bit of leverage. Like I had the option to stay at the University of Toronto if I wanted on a longer contract because I could say, oh, look, I got this other thing. But at the end of the day, a permanent position is going to win out. So I left for the University of Cincinnati. And this transition was intense. I had just gotten off of what was the most stressful period of my life, working full time on teaching, which I enjoyed, but with a lot of work all of the incredible stress and the emotions that were going along with my PhD, doing all of these applications. My wife and I were trying to have a baby at the time as well. It was just a lot. I specifically actually remember when I applied to the University of Cincinnati job, I had taught all the way through the day. And then all the way up to three in the morning, I was working on revisions to my PhD that were requested by the external examiner. So like I had to do that at five in the morning, I caught the plane to the University of Cincinnati for the interview. Like. It was just an incredibly stressful time. But then I got to the University of Cincinnati and everything that I'd been working for, what I had hoped for, well, I had it. I had this great teaching position. I could do scholarship in mathematics education, but I didn't have to do mathematics research. I was in a new city. I was in a new country. We had a new baby shortly thereafter. It was this crazy transformation and I poured myself into it. Well, my teaching at the University of Toronto, I, I went up and did it as sort of my best I did. I didn't study teaching. I, I didn't really work on developing as a teacher, but at the University of Cincinnati, I did. I went to my first conference called Math Fest that, that was focused on the education side. And I just remember for days, just writing notes after notes after notes of teaching idea and teaching idea that I could implement into my teaching. And I poured myself into that job. I was finally doing something that I loved, something that I was proud of, something that I, I felt like I was doing a good job of. And I was doing everything that I could to build a rapport with my students, to learn about the best ways to be a teacher, to put in those, the extra effort, the extra mile to be the best teacher that I could be. And, and I was changing. I, I changed probably the most in sort of like my, my core sort of sense of self in that short period of time than, than probably any other period of my life because I was pouring myself into something that I really loved doing and kind of replacing the negativity that had sort of built up throughout my PhD, both towards mathematics. I mean, I was loving even mathematics more teaching it than I ever was when I was really studying the, the intricacies as part of graduate school. I loved my time at the University of Cincinnati. I loved the job, I loved our friends, I loved the life that we built there, but it wasn't enough. There was one thing missing, which is that my wife and I both grew up in Victoria, British Columbia, on the far west coast of Canada. It is one of the greatest places to live. All of our family is there. We were creating a new family, and all of our family from Victoria, they could only come and visit us. And so this call to move back to Canada, try to get closer to home, just became louder and louder. And I mean, my wife had was amazing, right? She had followed me internationally. We've been for 10 years away from our family between, you know, master's and PhD and these different professorship jobs. Like, we'd spent a long time away from family and it was great, but we wanted to go home. And so I started applying. But 
I only wanted to apply for another really good job. It wasn't going to take just anything. It had to be a good job at the right location as opposed to the good job that I had, but at the wrong location. So I actually really focused on improving myself. Now I was doing that already for very authentic reasons for my, for my own sort of emotional state and my own love of teaching. But I now was putting a twist on it of trying to make myself look good. And what I mean by this is I was saying yes to everything. If there was a conference that I could go and present at, I was going to say yes to this. If there was a new technology tool that I could implement in the classroom, I'd say yes to this. If I could do an educational research study, I was going to say yes to this. And I was building up this narrative, like I'll try flipped classrooms, that will look good. And I think it's good for the students, but, but part of me was also doing it because it would tell a story about my teaching that I could put on a cover letter. And I put so much work in on sort of improving like the CV part of myself in tandem with the, the authentic part, which was, you know, trying to do what was best for my students. I was feeling both of those emotions at the same time. And I started winning awards. I, I actually won four different teaching awards in sort of this uh, quick succession. And I don't mean this is bragging. I mean... I was doing work that would try to get noticed, hopefully by jobs back at the time, but in the interim by these local teaching awards. And the result of this is that who I was as a teacher, it really did just dramatically change in the period of three years. And in those three years, I applied to three jobs back in Canada. The first job uh, was fairly far east. Uh, I got an in-person interview. I flew out there, which meant I was sort of top three. I didn't get the job and I, I was okay with it. It wasn't a perfect match. It was still too far from home. Then in the second year, I applied to a second job. I got an in-person interview. I flew out there and I came second. Uh, there was one little thing about the job description that I was completely inexperienced for. It made sense, but they actually held on to me for a while. They said, look, we really do want you. We're gonna to try to make a position for you. Being second wasn't the end. They tried for months and months and months and the money fell out. I would have taken that job in a heartbeat, but I'd come second. And so meanwhile in Cincinnati, uh, we're starting to think about buying a house. I was applying for the green card. We're setting up our lives in the United States. We were thinking, well, maybe we'll have another baby soon. And then the University of Victoria for the first time in years posted a job opening. They were gonna have the perfect tenure track teaching professor position, an ideal position in so many ways at the University of Victoria. I pulled out all of the stops as you could imagine in my application. I, uh, I put in my application, I got an interview, I flew out there, it went great, and I came second for, for months. Uh, and then one day I got the email. I was no longer second. I was now first and I, I told my wife and uh, it was a long night. We called all the different members of our family saying, finally, finally, we were gonna be able to come home. You might think this is funny, but one of the weird things about uh, the, the visa was that I owned is I couldn't do any other work outside of the University of Cincinnati. And so even though I had started a YouTube channel, I mean, this was part of my like, I'm gonna do everything that I possibly can kind of uh, feel to it. Uh, I actually wasn't able to monetize anything YouTube. I remember we flew across the Canadian border. We landed in Toronto halfway through our flight home. And the first thing I did when we landed is I opened up the YouTube app and I turned on monetization on YouTube. I think I had about 30,000 subscribers at the time. And well, you know, the rest is history here. But more importantly, we got to move back home. And I am so fortunate. The University of Victoria job is fantastic. It is the best of the jobs that I've had of my three professorship positions. This is the best one. I've now since gone in tenure. There's a great balance between being able to teach as well as to do scholarship and service so that I can do a lot of other things other than just teaching classes, like for example, the YouTube that I do here. It's this great balance. And, and I have this balance between my work life and my home life. All of the stresses of the Toronto era doing my PhD, I don't have to worry about them. The stresses of the Cincinnati era, this idea that it's great, but it's at the wrong location. I don't have to worry about this. I can just do precisely the things that I think have the most impact academically and for my students while balancing it with living in an incredible place with all the family that we have around us. I've somehow managed to get the dream. So that's my story with a lot of work. It was a lot of transformation over years, but that's how I got my job as a professor. And I don't know if that's gonna represent anybody else, but it certainly represents 
me. Now I've spoken about my passion for supporting students as they're learning mathematics. And so what I would like to share now is the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform for math, for science, and for computer science. And they have thousands of lessons. And what I really appreciate about them is that their lessons are deeply interactive. You get to be in the driver's seat of your own learning, playing around with different animations, testing your understanding, writing code, and being supported if you ever screw up. Brilliant's lessons are really well scaffolded so that for every learning objective, you master each individual step before you go on to the next one. So you can make tremendous progress if you're working regularly over time, doing a little bit each day, never feeling completely overwhelmed. I talked about my transformation at the University of Cincinnati. Part of that was about embracing this kind of student-centered active learning that Brilliant is really putting as to part of their core design of their lessons. And so as a result, I'm actually really proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has for free, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, that's me, or click the link down in the description. And additionally, clicking that link will give you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited access to everything that Brilliant has to offer. With that said and done, thank you for listening to my story. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to ask any questions about the journey down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.